should know to prevent the COVID-19 second wave and save lives. This is Anna Teti, Professor of Histology at the University of L'Aquila and Chair of the TMS. And I have the honor to introduce you to excellent speakers, Professor Alberto Mantovani, immunologist and professor of general pathology at the Humanities Research Hospital in Milan, Italy, who will talk about COVID-19 and immunity, progress and challenges. And Professor uh, Taki Yamada, uh, venture partner or Frazier Healthcare Partners, uh, Menlo Park in California, USA, who will tell us about his thoughts on vaccines. So the roundtable will be chaired by Professor Nicola Petrosillo, Director of the Clinical and Research Department of Infection Diseases at the Lazzaro Spallanzani Hospital in Rome, that you know very well uh, because he presented an excellent lecture to the TMS during the lockdown. So I hope you will enjoy the event and will contribute to what we expect will be a lively discussion. So I hand over now to Professor Petrosillo, who will introduce the speakers. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Teddy. Uh, welcome to our I wish to thank the University of Latvia and the people joined this important webinar with well-renowned speakers. The title is a little ambitious. I think that predicting changes in the in the incidence of uh, 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 SARS-CoV-2 in humans requires understanding of uh, the interaction between natural processes such as uh, host immunity and intervention such as uh, physical distancing and washing masks and so on. Therefore, the study of uh, complementary theoretical insights into the dynamics of the uh, host pathogen interaction is uh, becoming very important relevant uh, intervention can be uh, can be uh, conceptualized as breaking one or more rings of the chain of infection which in turn relate to natural processes accompanying the life cycle of the virus the first link of the chain of infection is the virus itself the chain of infection could be uh, interrupted uh, at the point of the reservoir, which can be which can include uh, uh, hosts and uh, the environment. The third ring of the chain is represented by the transfer of the virus between hosts, interrupting the transfer of viruses between hosts being the main target of control measures. The use of surgical masks reduces uh, respiratory spread of uh, infected droplets and potentially can minimize uh, the spread of infection. So, so we, we should consider the portal of exit and the portal of entry of uh, respiratory viruses as link to be broken for minimizing the spread of infection. The last link uh, is represented by the characteristic of the susceptible host. It has been estimated that about uh, 11% of individuals worldwide in the general population have antibodies against uh, SARS-CoV-2 and for healthy immunity we need uh, more people. The, it has been estimated uh, more than two-thirds of the population uh, or less if we consider population heterogeneity. More recently, a deeper insight has been given to human genetic uh, differences accounting uh, for a less or more severe course of COVID-19. And to train the natural immunity of which Professor Mantovani is a great expert. So it's a great pleasure to introduce the, the first speaker, Professor Mantovani, which uh, uh, curriculum with uh, Vita is, uh, is unbelievable. Uh, I just want to, to, to read that he, he, he was president of International Union of Immunological Societies. Uh, he was uh, Head of the Department of Immunology and Cell Biology of uh, the Instituto di Ricerche Mario Negri, Milan, Italy. Uh, he is a scientific director of Instituto Clinico Humanita, Humanitas, president of Fondazione Humanitas. Uh, he is full professor of general pathology, School of Medicine Humanitas in, uh, in Milan and uh, a chair of inflammation and therapeutic innovation in uh, London and uh, Queen Mary University. He has a lot of publication, a lot of, and uh, uh, more than uh, uh, 1,200 uh, publications with unbelievable age index. Please, Professor Mantovani. 
Good afternoon. Well, in the case of Tachi, good, uh, it's, it's a different time scale. <laughs> but for those of you who are in Italy, all of you, uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you. I am going to share my screen now. Hopefully, it, it will work. Here it is. Can you see? Can you see my pointer? Yes, we can. Good. So, uh, I'm a I'm a medical doctor and an immunologist and sorry and an oncologist by training, but I'm an immunologist by vocation. So this is my representation of the immune system. Extremely complex. We don't know all the instruments, the repertoire, and the players. Uh, in the immune system. And when I was confronted with COVID-19, and that was in February, uh, gosh, for some reason, the presentation is stuck for some reason, and I'm not, I'm sharing my screen, but, uh, oh yes, here it is. Uh, could you please try to, oh, yeah. okay, good. Oh, now, so now it's working. So I was confronted with uh, SARS-CoV-2, and this is the virus as seen by, uh, by my, three of my grandchildren. And you can see, clearly see the spike protein here. And this is how uh, I felt. I went back to uh, Greek philosophy, and that's Socrates, I know that I don't know. And there is still... It's much more what I don't know about the virus and its interaction with the immune system uh, and, uh, uh, than what I know. And for those of you who are interested, the uh, Accademia Nazionale dei Lincei for Tachi, this is the National Academy of Science. The Accademia Nazionale dei Lincei is, is a document and we, are a, we have a journey through the summer and we are preparing the new version of it. So you, uh, you can find there. All I know about, all, all we know, and it's three of us who are responsible for that, and it's the Health Commission of Academia Nazionale uh, dei Lincei. So this is a summary of, uh, of, the, of the story. First of all, the virus, let me make a comment. I'm not a virologist, but of course, I have to keep, keep track of the enemy. And in addition, some of the molecules that we identified uh, have been we have been involved in, in uh, studies in prime journals concerning these uh, the interaction of molecules that we cloned or uh, we identified and uh, viruses or pathogens or microbial pathogens. So uh, the virus interacts, but there is an issue about the presence and the occurrence of the virus in cells of the immune system. The outcome of the interaction is dictated by viral load, of course. We have had uh, springtime, summertime, less. And uh, as Nicola said, we are protecting ourselves. And uh, people at risk, elderly people, fragile people are protecting themselves. Viral load, aging. Inflammation is very important for aging. Uh, lifestyle, of course, smoking, for instance. And genetics. And let me have a comment on genetics. I think we did... We had the first uh, study on the genetics of the human population in open access, Stefano Guga. And then we were part of a European study with colleagues in Spain, Germany, Norway, uh, on genome-wide association of severe COVID uh, with respiratory failure. And this is the, the message. Uh, genetics is important. Uh, chromosome 3, where chemokines, some chemokines are located, uh, and, and this is interesting for me because our group was one of the groups who originally described chemokines, but the jury is still out concerning blood groups. We had a report on blood groups, and, and this is, the jury is still out. So this is science. Nicola and Tachirana, young people, science, you are ready to question your own data. And this is the blood. And you see it's much weaker in general. So uh, no question about genetics, no question about chromosome 3, genes of the immune system, 
but question mark about back uh, go. Then uh, the innate immune system uh, is confronted with a virus. And there is a cellular arm, a human alarm, which we clone some of the molecules here. And, uh, and of course, let me remind you that in 90% of the cases, the innate immune system takes care of our encounters with, with uh, pathogens. And, and this is how we dissect uh, uh, innate immunity in this particular case uh, with on, on uh, PBMC, peripheral blood of our patients, then single cell analysis and single cell analysis run on patients in the United States and Israel. So international dimension, handling of complex data that require bioinformatics and artificial uh, intelligence. And uh, of course, then you have the directors of the immunological orchestra, the T cells, uh, and you have production of antibodies. So the adaptive immune system. And of course, downstream of uh, plasma cells and B cells, you have antibodies. And of course, we have serology. Here, for instance, is uh, a uh, our own effort that was put in open access and now is impressed in nature communication. We have done a relatively large for the time, at the time, uh, serological analysis, 4,000 subjects in our community, showing differences, and Nicole alluded to it, differences in the frequency of people positive for antibodies. And we do know, we don't know, for instance, a study that is now uh, available in cell by Hans Gustav Jungren and colleagues at, uh, at Karolinska, showing that this is obviously an underestimate uh, of uh, the number of people who have been exposed to the virus. And we have our own data on that. And of course, this type of study is very important uh, for uh, the follow up and for understanding how long does memory last. But again, the antibodies are just the tip of the iceberg of the response. Downstream of recognition by innate adaptive immunity is failure, effective of inappropriate T cell responses, uncontrolled inflammation, uh, late antibody appearance, and cytokine resistance system syndrome macrophage activation, and endothelial cell activation. And of course, we're all familiar with acute respiratory distress syndrome and all the problems. Let me just emphasize that there is a new disease called multisystem inflammatory syndrome. Uh, C stands for children, adolescents more than, I mean, children. It's a late new disease that was originally described in the UK and in Bergamo, in northern, northern Italy. It was originally named as a Kawasaki-like uh, syndrome. It's an inflammatory syndrome that appears after resolution, apparent resolution of the infection, apparent resolution of the infection. So we are confronted with new scenario. And again, there is uh, uh, much more uh, uh, that we don't know than what we know, at least that I know. Let's put it this way. And, well, I, the only, I mean, touch is going back to that, I'm sure. The only uh, therapeutic strategy that has been proven to improve uh, death uh, are low-cost glucocorticoids. The original study is Hornby et al. in UK, and uh, there is a new, there are new st studies and uh, our, uh, my colleague, uh, ICU colleague, uh, uh, Maurizio Cecconi, uh, was part of, of, of this uh, WHO effort. Uh, but the scenario is changing. Let me go back to the, this situation down here. Uh, some of us were aware of the data, but the data are now uh, available in science. There are two studies again, with a, a significant Italian contribution, because 
uh, Andrea Biondi at San uh, uh, Gerardo Hospital and the group at uh, San Matteo Hospital and then uh, uh, the group uh, I'm missing someone, uh, there was a third group, oh, San Raffaele Hospital. Uh, and the, the, uh, the study was coordinated by uh, Jean-Laurent uh, Casanova and by Gigi Notarangelo at NIH. And, and I think that this changes a little bit the landscape again. Well, first of all, a substantial fraction of patients with life-threatening COVID-19 have what we now call inborn error of uh, immunity, uh, and in particular of type 1 interferon-mediated immunity. Uh, inborn errors is what we used to call immunodeficiency. It's actually immunodeficiency. Uh, and in parallel, uh, essentially the same group discovered that in another subset of patients, there are autoantibodies that block the same pathway, which turns out to be, as we may have guessed, uh, which turns out to be essential for the first line of resistance and then activation of an appropriate adaptive immune res response. So the general, I will stick out my neck and say that the general picture is that COVID-19, um, I mean, severe COVID-19, is at the, located at the interception between uh, autoimmunity, immunodeficiency, and uncontrolled inflammation. I will not talk about vaccines. Uh, I think Tachi is going to discuss that. Let me just mention uh, an aspect of va vaccines that uh, usually is not under the limelight, and that is pathogen agnostic protection conferred by vaccines. Uh, and this is a slide that is taken from a review that uh, 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 a paper that uh, I was uh, asked to write for New England Journal. Uh, and Mihai Nitya and, and myself wrote, wrote the paper. And in essence, we, let me remind you that when my grandchildren are vaccinated against measles, they will be protected against measles, but they will also be protected against, for instance, upper respiratory tract infection. That's a most dramatic case, but there is plenty of evidence for that, correlative evidence that BCG uh, may do the same. And this is uh, associated with what has now been called training, and uh, Mihai Netea is the guy who called training. Training. Uh, I did some of the early uh, early studies on that in vertebrates. Training of innate immunity, and of course, uh, we cannot suggest people to uh, get, for instance, a BCG vaccine because the uh, prospective control studies are ongoing, so we don't have the answer. What we can say to people, I think, is that they should get their shots. Uh, for instance, uh, in this season, they should get, uh, they should get their shots. Uh, uh, in the case of elderly people, flu, uh, pneumococcus, and herpes, they should get their shots also with the idea that this is good training, good general training for their uh, immune system. And so let me go back to philosophy. Uh, I know that I don't know, and I know and I realize when confronted with COVID-19 that nature is fond of hiding herself, as uh, the philosopher Heraclitus said uh, 2,000 years ago. And this is uh, an Italian painter, Lucio Fontana, and I think that these cuts uh, in the painting uh, is an invitation to go for the unknown. And once more, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Mantovani. It's a very, very interesting uh, short presentation just to, to begin the, the discussion. Um, I I, I don't see hands. I have some uh, some questions for Professor uh, Mantovani. Um, you were talking about uh, selected vaccines uh, such as uh, BCG or microbial component that can uh, boost antimicrobial uh, function in uh, myeloid cells that uh, are responsible for. Uh, uh, for, uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, of uh, 
innate immune uh, immunity, uh, the so-called uh, trained uh, innate immunity. What's he, what is your opinion uh, regarding uh, studies uh, that uh, uh, compared uh, B BCG coverage uh, and the COVID-19 incidents uh, uh, worldwide? Yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, this is one of, of the strong evidence for that. Uh, I mean, there is plenty of data on that. Uh, there is one uh, PNAS paper that uh, we quote uh, in, in the New England paper, uh, which reports a meta-analysis of the epidemiology of BCG coverage and susceptibility, uh, uh, susceptibility to COVID-19. Uh, in terms of actual, uh, at the end of the paper, we say we, we should not use BCG to prevent COVID-19, uh, except for uh, being part of a controlled clinical study. And there are now, uh, we, uh, our headcount is, is 10 prospective trials uh, aimed at assessing uh, BCG in a prospective way. And there is actually a prospective, but I think the evidence is, does not allow us to make a recommendation. The only recommendation we can make, I think, is uh, get your shots. It's good training for uh, the immune system. Some of us uh, feel that perhaps one of the reasons why uh, children are relatively resistant to COVID-19 is that their immune system is, uh, is trained, by, is submitted to, uh, subjected to, to regular training by uh, the vaccination calendar, but that's, again, it's, it's circumstantial evidence. It's, it's not prospective. Uh, uh, clinical trial. Yes, that's true. The, I, I know a trial by a Danish group on healthcare workers, uh, uh, and the, the the aim was to reduce uh, the, uh, the the days of the the healthcare workers not working uh, mainly. Yes. Just to uh, that's very interesting. Uh, I don't see uh, hands raised. Uh, Anna, if you have questions. Uh, uh, I have, I have, uh, I have one. I have a very interesting because uh, a, a group in the United States, uh, the first author is uh, is an Italian uh, Grifoni, uh, recently uh, uh, identified uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 reactive CD4 T cells uh, uh, in individuals uh, that were uh, unexposed to COVID suggesting uh, cross-reactivity uh, T-cell recognition uh, between uh, circulating uh, common cold uh, coronavirus, because uh, uh, coronavirus is, as you perfectly know, is a family of viruses, uh, including uh, a common cold. And uh, don't you think this could be another reason for uh, uh, differences uh, in the, in the spread of infection and uh, waves uh, of uh, of uh, spread of uh, of this uh, uh, virus uh, in the, in a susceptible population. Yeah, I think the the, the, the paper is very interesting, uh, and uh, actually two papers. And uh, Alessandro Sette uh, is one of the of the co-authors of of, uh, of the study. I think it's very interesting. Uh, uh, the epidemiological evidence uh, is not, as far as I understand, as far as I can see, does not really provide strong suggestion that if you get a common cold, that simplifies things a little bit. You have, you have a relative protection. And uh, I learned uh, from tumor immunology that sometimes you have, you can demonstrate that uh, there are uh, you have T cells that recognize tumor cells, but uh, they are actually not really very effective. Let's put it this way. So I think it will be very important to get epidemiological evidence to show that this type of reactivity is actually uh, relevant for resistance. But it's very interesting. Yeah, I, no, I would like just to propose to. Hear uh, Professor Yabada talk on uh, his thoughts on vaccines, and then we can have uh, uh, a general discussion on both uh, presentations. Oh. Okay, okay, thank you, Professor Mantovani. That's my great pleasure 
to introduce uh, Professor Yamada. Professor Yamada is uh, a venture partner with Fraser Healthcare mm -hmm. Partner, and uh, he, uh, uh, he focuses on creating uh, companies and providing uh, strategic guidance to existing companies. He's uh, chairs of uh, boards of uh, several uh, companies, Fatom Pharmaceutical, Passage Via, and serves as director of Agilent Technology, and more and more. He uh, also served as a president, a very, very important uh, president of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Global Health Program. Uh, he was also a member of the board of directors of Glaxo, Smith & Klein, and before of the uh, the part chair, chair of the Department of Internal Medicine, the physician mm -hmm. is a medical doctor at the Michigan Medical Center. Um, mm -hmm. Professor Yamada is uh, a member mm -hmm. of the National Academy of Medicine of the States uh, and uh, has been a conferred also an honorary appointment as Knight Commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire. The Honorary mm -hmm. Citizen Award from the Government of Singapore and the Order or the Rising Sun Gold and Silver Stars from the Japanese Government. The, the, the talk of uh, Professor Yamada is uh, Thoughts about the Vaccine. Please, Professor Yamada. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Petrosio. Uh, can you see me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. We can hear you, but we see you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and I'm uh, I'm pleased to follow Professor Matabani's excellent scientific presentation, in which he discussed much of uh, what I was hoping to mention in my uh, my brief comments from a public health standpoint. I have to ask, where are we today? Um, the first case of COVID-19 was re reported, as you know, on December 31st of 2019. If it had been reported one day later, it would be called COVID-20, but it's called COVID-19. Uh, amazingly enough, the first genome sequence of SARS-CoV-2 was published online and shared globally just 11 days later on January 10th, 2020. By March 11th, the disease was global and the WHO declared it to be a pandemic. And you all know today there are more than 34 million cases and greater than 1 million deaths. What is most amazing is that today we have multiple vaccines available and will likely be distributed in the first quarter of 2021. So what do we think about the vaccines and what is behind our thinking about the vaccines? Let me, let me discuss a few observations. First, the people who get infected do generally develop a strong antibody response. And once infected, it's rare that someone gets reinfected. So the antibody response seems to be protective, at least for a while. However, as plainly observed in many reports, sometimes the sickest patients have the highest neutralizing antibody levels. Therefore, it's clear that protection against the most severe consequences of infection seems to require more than just antibodies. A robust cellular and innate immune response seems to be necessary for that, as pointed out by Professor Matabani. In addition, the majority of people who are exposed to the virus don't seem to get infected. And the majority of people who get infected have no or very mild symptoms. This implies that there must be some sort of widespread pre-existing protection, if not immunity. How is this possible? Well, the answer seems to vary from group to group. But here are some hypotheses. For children, it may be because they are vaccinated with the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. As has been observed by many, 
the sequence there is ho sequence homology between SARS CoV-2 and the measles and mumps viruses in their fusion proteins. And there's 29% amino acid homology between the macro domains of SARS-CoV-2 and the rubella virus. Interestingly, widespread use of the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine began in the 1960s. So people who are over the age of 60 generally not had MMR. And, of course, that may be at least one reason why there is this disparity between the high mortality observed in the elderly and the relatively low mortality observed in children. One of the remarkable aspects of this pandemic is that there is a huge disparity in the deaths, the per million population observed between nations in Asia and nations in Western Europe or in the United States. In general, the Asian nations had a number of something less than 20 deaths per million. Whereas in the US and Western Europe, the deaths per million number in the six to 700 per million. One possible reason for this is the widespread use of BCG in Asia. In Asia, tuberculosis was a major problem after the war, and BCG vaccine became very commonly used and mandated in most countries in Asia. And as pointed out by Professor Matsubani, BCG seems to work by training innate immunity. One of the most recent observations is uh, a study conducted in Europe that showed that BCG vaccination resulted in a 79% reduction in respiratory, respiratory of probable viral origin in the elderly. Now this was not specifically against SARS-CoV-2, but it was against respiratory viruses of all causes. For the general population, there are coronavirus associated with co the common cold. And there may be some sort of immune response to them that may provide a level of cross protection against SARS-CoV-2. There's an interesting study in San Diego that indicated that if investigators pulled samples, random samples out of the freezer from uh, subjects that they drew the blood from in 2016 and 17, long before SARS-CoV-2 came about, and then uh, tested them they noted that 50% of their samples had T cells, which cross reacted with SARS CoV 2. So, the conclusion from all of this is that there may be some sort of basic underlying non specific immunity that may be as high as 50% of the population. And in addition, of just 15 to 20% additional infection, infections could lead to what is known as herd immunity. What are the implications of these findings with regard to the vaccines that are available? As I noted, there are at least a dozen vaccines which are likely to be available at the beginning of, the, of next year. At this point, in the rate at which people will be vaccinated and the rate at which there is some sort of resistance to the, to the virus, it may be that in reality, the vaccines will not have much impact beyond where the disease is going today. However, there is no question that vaccines are absolutely required to restore public confidence. Now, how will that confidence be engendered? First of all, we do know that, uh, if you, don't, if you have a vaccine that doesn't have an impact on cellular or innate immunity, uh, it, may not, it may protect against infection, but it may not protect against the worst consequences of infection. Secondly, vaccine safety has yet to be determined. There's this phenomenon called 
antibody dependent enhancement where the disease actually gets worse with the vaccine. This has been observed most famously with RSV and more, most recently with dengue vaccines and is said to have been observed with other coronavirus vaccines. In the mid 1970s, there was an outbreak of swine flu. And in the United States, at least, there was a mandated vaccination uh, of all military personnel with this vaccine. And there was a surprisingly high number of patients with Guillain-Barre syndrome. And of course, you've heard most recently, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine produced a patient with transverse myelitis. The clinical studies have resumed in Europe, but in the US, the FDA has, has prevented the studies from continuing because they believe they have additional information that requires explanation before opening the studies up again. So there are going to be many vaccines and they're going to be made available to the public without their safety having been tested, with their efficacy being tested only minimally. And they'll be widely distributed because of the mandate, the requirement for the public for general confidence. Then the question becomes, how do you make the vaccine available for everyone? You see, it takes a long time to make vaccines. The largest manufacturing facility in the world for making vaccines is at, in India, at the Serum Institute of India. This organization produces more than 60% of the world's vaccines today. And their full capacity is 60 million doses per month. That means about 700 million doses per year and most of the vaccines require two doses so those 700 doses can service about 350 million people so just to vaccinate everybody in india will require three years of full manufacturing by this facility that means they can't make vaccines for all the other diseases in the world that they make vaccines for now the full manufacturing capacity of the world may be on the order of 200 million doses per month, or roughly 100 million people can get the vaccine each month. So you can imagine there is a long line waiting for this vaccine. One of the major problems in the world has been in the past, nations who have vaccine manufacturing capacity nationalize their vaccine supply. So in other words, if a country makes a vaccine, it will not allow the exportation of the vaccine outside their country until everybody in their country has been vaccinated first. The other problem is that rich countries have co-opted the manufacturing capacity of the world. They have already pre-purchased the capacity of most of the major manufacturing uh, sites and uh, manufacturing companies. It's not clear what that means. It's not clear whether they will be able to receive vaccinations from outside their country before that country has already made its supply. But it does mean that they will get it before people who haven't paid. Then there's this question of logistics and storage. You see, the Pfizer vaccine, for example, has to be stored at minus 70 degrees. You can imagine the logistics challenge of storing all the vaccines at minus 70 degrees. It usually gets distributed in dry ice. Once you open the package of dry ice, then you, you really have very limited number of times you can open that package. The Moderna vaccine requires minus 20 degrees. Just to monitor that any dose of vaccine has not been exposed to temperatures above the minus 70 degrees or minus 20 degrees is a challenging task in and of itself. Then there's a the question of whether you store the vaccines in multi-dose vials versus pre-filled syringes. Most countries in the, in the Western world 
like their vaccines in pre-filled syringes. They don't like multi-dose vials because of the potential for infection of the supply every time you break the seal of the multi-dose vial. You can imagine shipping one or two billion pre-filled syringes. It would fill 10747 airplanes at the very least. Then the question is prioritization. Who gets the vaccine first? Is it the nations that are at greatest risk? Is it the primary uh, healthcare workers in those countries? Is it the elderly? Is it the school children? These decisions have not been made and there will be tremendous contentiousness when everybody understands that there is very limited supply even if the vaccine is launched at the, in the first quarter of next year. We do not yet have the infrastructure or the operating principles to make this kind of mass vaccination simple, intelligent, and successful. And that is our biggest challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yamada. Now we have the questions. Uh, we already asked the several questions to Professor Mantovani, but I see that uh, there are some questions, and I ask uh, uh, Professor Teddy to help me. Uh, I have a, a, a question for, for Professor Yamada that is uh, um, how long will uh, immunity caused by the vaccine uh, will, uh, will last? I mean, uh, uh, natural and cellular immunity, in your opinion? Yeah, we have no information at this point. We have no understanding of this. And generally, when a vaccine is released under normal circumstances, there is at least data to suggest one or two years of coverage. We have no idea at this point how long the uh, immunization will last. And we don't yet have a correlate of protection. We don't know that there is a certain level of antibodies that will provide protection or, or, or not. And whether cellular uh, immunity has to be present to provide protection. So we're, we're moving so quickly that at this point, we have no idea of how long the immunity will last and what the correlates of protection will be, even if we have levels of antibody that will persist. But right now, the natural, the natural infection produces an antibody response that is relatively short-lived. It looks like about six months or after six months, quite, quite a bit of the antibody response uh, is reduced. Thank you, Professor. Professor Mantovani, you raised your hand. Yeah, a fantastic talk. And I have a vested interest. What about, you mentioned elderly people <laughs> and, and fragile people. Are we yeah. going to get, and of course that would be a priority, uh, I guess, after, after healthcare workers, for frontline um, people. Uh, are we going to get a minimum information about response? I mean, we know that in flu we get, and of course we lose repertoire, we lose memory, uh, uh, immunological memory, I mean. <laughs> Do you have a sense about that? Yeah, you know, the thing is, it's a brand new game here, because in the case of flu, antibody levels are a good correlate of protection. In, the case, in this case, we do not know, and we will not know because the vaccine will be rushed out there so quickly. Um, so it, it's going to be kind of like the wild, wild west. We're going to be vaccinating a lot of people. We'll be gathering data as we vaccinate people. Uh, you know, the, the big question is how much protection will they be for the elderly as opposed to the young? Uh, you know, at least the antibody levels with most of the vaccines seems to be similar for the elderly as, as for the young people. But that doesn't mean 
protection per se, because protection in the elderly may require much more. And so, and, and the other part of it is that although this virus is, is mutating at maybe half the rate as influenza, it is still mutating. So we don't know after vaccination what is the frequency with which you will have to be vaccinated again with a different strain as, uh, as, as we have to vaccinate ourselves uh, every year with influenza uh, in order to cover the strains. So these are all questions that we wish we had the time to answer before launching the vaccine. But both public and political pressure are forcing us to move quickly with a vaccine into the marketplace before any of these questions can be answered. Um, there are several questions Please, in the John. chat. So uh, there are many, so maybe we can have short answers. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. so uh, from Vincenzo Soflati, uh, Prof. Mantovani, yesterday evening on TV you said that Mr. Trump was treated with the monoclonal antibodies that are not proven to work. So on what basis Mr. Trump was treated with those antibodies? Well, uh, it's compassionate use, it's what is defined compassionate use. Let, let me summarize the situation concerning treatment with antibodies. First of all, uh, it's in the roots of immunology to use the, the plasma from people who recover to treat uh, patients. So there is plenty of evidence and widespread use. There has been plenty of, plenty of of usage of uh, hyperimmune plasma also in, in this country. Uh, and then, uh, and there are three, unfortunately, there are three controlled trials uh, with negative results. And one is, uh, was run uh, in, in, in the Netherlands, uh, one was run in China. Uh, 100 patients and didn't achieve the, the, the prospective 200 patients, and one was run in India. Uh, then there are monoclonal antibodies. To the best of my knowledge, there are data. Uh, I haven't seen act the actual data, but they say there are data from phase two, which are encouraging. Yeah, 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 yeah. uh, but, but again, uh, again, we. Cool. Do not have evidence. Have an echo in my in my. Uh, I mean, there is no evidence from a controlled trial. My my bias is that antibodies are going to help. Uh, uh, we use them for treatment of cancer, some infectious diseases, autoimmunity, and more. Uh, and so, but they have. You have to find, or we will have to find the right window for usage of antibody, as as we did for glucocorticoids. I mean, there's a matter of low cost. I mean, initially there was an official recommendation by WHO, and there was an official recommendation uh, in China not to use glucocorticoids. And then uh, the, the empirical usage, uh, for instance, in my institution, and the clinical trials, again, we were involved in some of that, uh, showed that if you use them in the appropriate window, then they can help. So that's, going back to your question, that was labeled as compassionate usage. Okay, uh, thank you, Bruno. So yes, go ahead. Sorry, uh, sorry, Anna. Uh, there are two, uh, two uh, person asking uh, uh, that raised uh, the Antonio Maurizzi uh, Antonio Maurizzi Hi. please Antonio hello first of all congratulations to all the speakers and the chair very very nice events so uh, I have a question that can be addressed by both professor Yamada and professor Mantovani and I was thinking, so in the past we had other uh, outbreaks like the SARS in the 2002 and the MERS, but why the COVID-19 virus spread worldwide 
so fast, so compared to the these other virus that we had, it is possible that there is uh, things related to genetics or population or whatever. Um, if if I could answer that, the first case of SARS-CoV-2 seems to be dated to November 17th, although the first report came December 31st. During that six weeks, you can imagine all the air travel throughout the world uh, from, you know, from anywhere. And effectively, the, the, the way that you try to deal with a pandemic is initially containment, but by the time it spread all over the world, containment was too late. It was not possible to contain it. And then there was very much a delay in reporting, not just in China, but everywhere else in the world, so that... The microphone of Professor Yamasaki. Yeah. Uh, please unmute uh, the Marco. Could you help us unmute? Uh, uh, Professor, Professor Yamada, I think you accidentally muted yourself. Could you? Oh, okay. okay, there we go. Okay. Is that all right? Yeah. No, it's again mute. It's again mute. Oh, you muted yourself again, or someone is muting you? Someone keeps on muting me, I think. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so what I was saying is that um, but three months after the first case, the first case, November 17th, reported December 31st, and March 11th is declared a pandemic. By then, it's everywhere. It's in every community. It's, it's spread so far and so fast that there's nothing we can do about containment. Then it, 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 then it requires some very drastic measures, which many communities were unprepared to in, implement immediately. So this is a, unfortunately a case of uh, rapid transit and very slow communication. Can I add something on top of that related to Northern Italy? Because uh, and we now have a picture. It's coming out in Nature. I mean, it's in open access, but it's coming out in, in Nature uh, communication uh, with an analysis of 350 isolates of the virus uh, in, in, the, in the Lombardy region. And the picture is very clear now. Uh, we had two tsunami in Northern Italy, both the virus entered at least twice independently uh, in Codogno, so south of the south part of Lombardy region and in the Bergamo area. Uh, on both cases, the uh, isolates show that the viruses uh, were kind of virus was coming from uh, Northern Europe, possibly Germany, because of the commercial relation, very strong relationship we have with Germany. And uh, what actually, uh, and the, the, uh, um, a, the main author is uh, Carlo Federico Perno, so Nicola knows him, <laughs> uh, a, a virologist, a uh, very good virologist. And uh, the, the, what happened is that for a month and a half, and you can, we can track back based on antibody, occurrence in, of antibodies in blood donations. So we had two tsunamis in, in the Lombardy region and northern part of Emilia uh, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a sea in, in a sea of tempest because of the uh, seasonal flu and seasonal uh, uh, pulmonary infection. For, for more than one month, one month and a half, uh, the, the virus ran all around in right. these areas. And this is why uh, we had such a disaster. Uh, I mean, so that, that's, it's just, I'm translating to Italy what Professor Yamada said at a global level. Anna. 
Anna, okay. Uh, Alessio, Cor Alessio Cortellini, please, uh, you raise uh, your hand. Alessio, do you want to ask a question? It was a mistake. Sorry. Okay, maybe I can read something from the chat. Um, somebody, somebody turned off his microphone. Uh, so we have Loredana here, uh, say very, very interesting, different SARS-CoV viral strains have been isolated so far, and uh, phylogenetic studies show that they may all be coming from a first common strain, while the virus mutated a farther passing on from one host to another, uh, did its characteristics change? Uh, sorry. Uh, this characteristics change, uh, so it became more or less virulent. But, uh, Professor Montavani probably knows much better than me, but as I understand it, the mutations observed thus far have not made it more virulent, but possibly uh, uh, more easily spread. Well, I, I, I'm not a virologist, let, let's, I'm an immunologist, but as I said, I have to follow what, and there has been a lot of debate in this country, and Nicole and I were commenting on, on this earlier, and there, there has been confusion between the pathogen and the disease, and since there are students, I, I think we should clarify that. Uh, the pathogen mutates, and there has been a, uh, there are, to the best of my knowledge, there are two papers in cell, one paper in the Lancet, and then this uh, upcoming paper from Northern Italy. Uh, and in essence, there was a mutation 614 for, I mean, there may be biologists, the PhD students, 614 GD mutation, and it may have made the virus worse, <laughs> but it's not 100% sure. Then there was a loss of uh, an open reading frame again in China, and then a few cases in Singapore, and that's the Lancet paper, uh, but just about 10 papers. And then another paper reported mutations in possibly in in vitro modes in both directions. Then the disease uh, is much less severe now, but the disease is less severe because we have had springtime, summertime, and Nicola knows much better than me <laughs> than that in springtime and summertime. Uh, upper respiratory tract, uh, pneumonitis, even coronavirus uh, pneumonitis get much better. Then we behave ourselves. I mean, we protect ourselves. We protect the fragile people. We make the diagnosis uh, much uh, earlier. We do early diagnosis. We treat earlier. So the people who get infected are younger and as was emphasized, by Professor Yamada, the younger people are more resistant. So the pathogen has not become kinder to us. Uh, uh, the disease is less severe because for other reasons. And if there are medical students or PhD students, don't mix up the pathogen with the disease. They are two different uh, things. And, and we give more steroids, uh, and we give anticoagulants, uh, and we care better these patients. This is uh, this is true. Okay. Anna, yeah. Yeah. yes. Uh, another question from Mauro Bologna: Can a cocktail of human monoclonals reach a satisfactory anti-COVID nineteen complications effect? can answer no answer to this question so a cocktail of human there, monoclonals there, yeah uh, there there is data from regeneron now that shows that if given early it can reduce the number of days of symptoms um, and as with most of these treatments uh, 
we don't know, this is a phase two study, so we don't know conclusively what it will show, but I suspect that the monoclonal antibodies will prevent infection and may lower viral load early, if given early, but if given late in the disease, the immune systems that have been activated uh, will be such that it will have a hard time preventing the worst outcomes of the illness, if given late. So, Nicola, is there anyone who raised the end? Uh, I don't think so. I, I just see Marco. Marco, do you want uh, to... Marco. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you both for your uh, amazing talks, really uh, top, top level. Uh, I have a question for Professor Yamada. Um, I guess it would be easier to produce genetic vaccines for uh, COVID-19. Uh, do you think that would be the way the world should go if we find a good genetic vaccine to produce enough vaccine for everyone in a short enough amount of time? You talking about like the RNA vaccines? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, th there's no question the RNA vaccines were very quick and um, you know have, have at least in the initial clinical trials shown that they can elevate antibodies levels. What's not clear is whether they will provide protection because there is not yet a good correlate of protection. So we'll find out when 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 this happens. I do know that. Uh, Moderna produced an influenza vaccine that produced a high antibody level but didn't protect. So in, in the case of influenza, their vaccine didn't work. They also had a dengue vaccine that didn't look like it worked either. So we're, we're you know, the world is a guinea pig here. We don't know what's going to happen. There is no question that the mRNA vaccines will elevate neutralizing antibody levels. Whether they will provide protection will have to be determined by clinical outcomes, which we didn't, we won't know for a while. Um, I have a question here from Katie Stoker. Um, she, it's a long question, but uh, she asks, how can a virus with a pandemic causing potential be quickly identified and distinguished compared to other novel illnesses? Who wants to reply? Alberto, you want to say something? The question again. Is how can a virus with a pandemic causing potential be quickly identified and distinguished compared to other novel illnesses? So how do we know that it is a dangerous virus? <laughs> yeah. Just a matter of getting uh, people... Uh, uh, heal, or uh, is there another way? I can just give you some. Uh, this is very difficult research to do, and <clears throat> there is a scientist who uh, has a joint appointment at the University of Wisconsin and the University of Tokyo, who is studying exactly this question when it came to influenza viruses, um, and he was publishing the results of his research and there became a large outcry as to whether that research should be published because of the potential that the information contained could be weaponized by countries. So if you do research and you do small mutations in a known virus to identify how to make the virus more virulent or less virulent, there is a real danger that that can be used for unethical purposes. And, and that created a scientific crisis of substantial magnitude. The National Academy of Medicine had to weigh in um, and to allow this person to publish the information. But it is a very difficult thing to do. For example, we now know coronavirus can cause this problem. Who's going to do research to determine which mutations makes it more virulent so it kills more people? Or how do we make it less virulent? You know, that, that requires uh, 
multi-mutation research, which can itself be dangerous. And, and, and that's the complexity of the question you're asking. Um, another question is from uh, Chiara Puri. In uh, your opinion, will we be able to eradicate SARS-CoV-2 or is it more likely that we will have to learn to live with it? So probably it's philosophy, but maybe you, you can compare with the previous pandemics. I think that more or less they all were over after a while. Sorry, Shall I, I comment in the meanwhile? Sure, yes. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, we should not forget that, uh, I mean, with vaccines, we can get rid of, uh, we did get rid of smallpox. And uh, as of two weeks ago, uh, Africa was declared free of polio. And that's, and the world could be free of polio. And we could have, we could eradicate uh, measles uh, with vaccines because you, it's only transmitted from man to man. Uh, so that's a, a precondition. Uh, what I, 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 I don't know what will happen with COVID-19, whether we will, uh, uh, we will live with COVID-19 or, or whether there will be uh, an extremely, extremely effective vaccines that may allow uh, the eradication of COVID-19 or whether uh, the virus will mutate. So I don't, I really don't have an answer. So I would, uh, and if I may uh, comment in general, uh, we may need more than a vaccine. I mean, um, for polio we had, and we have two vaccines, complementary vaccines, and we may need more than a vaccine to deal with COVID-19. Is it a bad idea to use the measles vaccine uh, to help also uh, adults to combat the virus? Or is uh, just a problem of training and not a problem of specificity against the coronavirus? If the question is to me, we need, I think that the if best... If we can use... The, no, if we yeah. can use the measles um, uh, vaccine to help adults to combat the virus, or is it just because in kids uh, there is this training that you were uh, describing? Actually, uh, as far as measles is concerned, measles, and this is relatively recent uh, evidence uh, coming from small communities uh, in, in Northern Europe that uh, don't don't, uh -huh. take, don't take the measles vaccine and and then got infected. And there were material to investigate uh, the immune system. Uh, the, uh, one of the reasons why measles cause uh, you have twenty percent to get at least twenty percent to get uh, uh, infections, other infections, is that measles wipes out immunological memory. Actually, there is a, a uh, th there has been a debate uh, as to uh, whether people, I, I hear a, an echo in other words. I, I hope yeah. you hear. Uh, someone but has the, the, main, the, the, main, should the main reason the for the pathogen agnostic uh, function of the measles vaccine, as far as I can see, is, has to do uh, with immunosuppression of adaptive immunity and wiping out of immunological memory to an extent greater than we believe by means rather than training. I hear a noise and I don't know whether you understand, you, you, you can hear me. Uh, uh, well, I could you hear, hear despite the noise, yes, I could uh, okay. hear. There yeah. was a science immunology paper uh, describing this. Uh, profound, profound immunosuppression and wiping out of B-cell immunological memory uh, by measles. May, may I ask both to Professor Yamada and Professor Mantovani a question uh, regarding uh, the, the very next uh, uh, use of uh, the vaccine against the flu 
if uh, uh, there will be any interaction in terms of uh, in, in uh, immuno uh, response uh, or uh, uh, some other uh, concern with the use of uh, or, or benefit with the use of both the vaccines in the in the, in, uh, the next uh, uh, winter. I'm not sure I understand the question. I do think everybody will be vaccinated, uh, and it's important to do so. Uh, but the number of people that can be vaccinated is very restricted. So as I mentioned, the total global supply of vaccine may be 200 million doses per month. And that means if people need two doses of the vaccine to be fully vaccinated, then only 100 million people can be vaccinated each month. So if you consider the number of people in the world, 6 billion, you know, what percentage can be vaccinated in the first year? It's a very small percentage, unfortunately. But everybody should be vaccinated. I, I agree on this comment because they are saying that we should be vaccinated, but then what is the capacity to provide vaccine for 7 billion and more people? So I think that this is really impossible. Yeah. Okay, I'm, so. I'm, we, uh, I'm sorry, uh, but I can I comment on that I'm, I'm going to have to sign off for, but thank you very much for allowing me to be a participant in this uh, symposium. Okay, thank you very thank much. You very much. Anna, shall I comment on, on flu? Sure, on, sure, yes. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, we, we uh, people should not uh, forget that, again, there is limited production capacity. Mm. I mean, in, in uh, Nicola may, may, may correct me, I think we used to have a coverage in our population all about 15%, healthcare workers about 30%, right? Three out of 10, more or less. Uh, now we would like to vaccinate many more people. And uh, the, the, the flu vaccine uh, is made in fertilized eggs. 90% of it is made in fertilized eggs. So there is a, a limited capacity, limited, and, and as to the best of my knowledge, there is only one facility uh, that makes a cellular uh, vaccine, cellular vaccine meaning vaccine produced uh, in, in eukaryotic cells. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so you, can, you have to think that uh, uh, you have to program have manufacturing facilities, you need to have the hands <laughs> that <laughs> prepare the eggs yeah. and then the fertilized eggs and then prepare. And one, I'm sorry, I forgot to say, as far as I remember, it's one egg, one dose of vaccine. Mm. So you can imagine the strain. So I think that the challenge that I mean, of course, the administration, uh, the, the politicians, uh, the regional and national, they have to, to work it out. But mm -hmm. in general, we have a challenge of making very good use of the vaccine that we have, yeah. that no vaccine dose is, uh, goes lost. <laughs> uh, I agree. I fully agree with you. So it's uh, they are telling us things that probably cannot be realized. Okay, so um, Nicola, any other questions in the chat that are questions that are more or less what we already asked? Otherwise, we can... Uh... I think that uh, there are more questions, but I don't know if we have time uh, enough to, to reply to everybody. I don't know how much time we have left. Well, we are over time already. Um, I mean, if there is anything really different from what has been asked, but I don't see. Uh, so they are more or less around the same uh, topic. Yeah. I don't know if, uh, Nicola, you have uh, uh, a specific question for uh, 
Uh, Alberto, if you want to, to say something more. Uh, no, no, I don't, I don't have a specific question. I just want to, to thank uh, uh, Professor Yamada that uh, left because another commitment and, and uh, Professor Mantovani because uh, the talk uh, was uh, very, very interesting, but also the, the, the chat was uh, unbelievable because we had a lot of uh, questions and uh, a lot of, of interesting replies. Uh, I, I wish to thank you, uh, Anna, uh, for your kind uh, <laughs> hospitality and uh, thank you to Marco Ponsetti for, uh, the, for his help uh, in, this, uh, in this webinar. So please, uh, Anna, to you. Th thank you very much. It's been really a pleasure and an honor to have you this evening with us and I'm very happy that uh, the young students here can understand what science is and the enthusiasm that there is uh, around the science. Uh, I think that uh, this is really very, very important. And uh, they have to, to uh, in some way, learn uh, to, to be uh, some way, I mean, uh, it's important that we criticize um, also our colleagues, also ourselves, because uh, science is not perfect. Uh, but, you know, with uh, some uh, method and uh, some uh, rigorous uh, uh, attitude, I think that we can uh, go on and maybe in the future, in the near future, we will, uh, uh, you know, win our battle against the, uh, the COVID-19, ready for another battle, because, of course, <laughs> another virus will come. So thanks a lot. And um, yeah, uh, for uh, the young students here, so these are outstanding scientists, and uh, maybe you don't know what they do, but you should do, you should uh, tend to do what they do, actually. So it's, uh, it's a way to, you know, to be attracted by science, and uh, everybody has a mentor that, you know, uh, we followed uh, what the mentor was uh, doing, and uh, this is why we are in science, and we learned how to deal with these important and very difficult uh, studies. So thank you very much, and I hope the last, I will Manna, go ahead. The last is to activate, each one will activate uh, his or her camera, because Marco will take a picture of all the people. Please activate your camera. Everybody. Don't be shy. Yes, just people. click. <laughs> please. Yeah, just a click, nothing else. Davide, Mauro, Antonio, please. Mauro Bologna, Davide Di Febbo, Antonio Maurizio, I see all the, the screen, I don't know how many, how many thank you, Mauro. Uh, sì, uh, sì, infatti. Okay, so Antonio, Eleonora, Cristiano, so just to, uh, switch on the, the camera and smile. Please. Okay, Marco, go ahead. Okay, done. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, I hope that we can uh, do another beautiful uh, TMS with uh, uh, you and other outstanding scientists. So thanks a lot. Bye bye. Grazie, saluto a tutti. Grazie a te, Alberto. Grazie tantissimo. Grazie, Nicola. Ciao, ciao.